Welcome to Machine Shop Tech Talk. I am here with my buddy Jason Roth today. Jason Roth is a former educator and now he is a thought leader towards education at Autodesk. Jason, I am so glad you could be here today, man. So we can talk education, we can talk visibility of the trades and we can dig into all things relating to those. I know you and I know each other, but the people out there listening, they may not be as familiar with you. Is there anything you wanted to add to that before we dig into the conversation today? Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, Arthur. I'm really excited to, to share uh, the things that I've learned, my past, uh, and, and, and what's going on now. But uh, yeah, so I spent 10 years at uh, Ivy Tech Community College in Indiana as a chair and assistant dean for our manufacturing engineering programs, and was a high school and middle school tech ed teacher, taught Project Lead the Way, as well as uh, your normal kind of tech courses, uh, wood shop and metals and all that. Worked in the industry uh, in vintage IndyCar and Formula One engine building, as well as Kaizen events for a division of Pratt & Whitney. So uh, a really eclectic uh, um, time in, in teaching and in the industry, as well as 24 years of coaching uh, as uh, within that. So uh, really excited to talk about education and where things are headed and what, what's going on now. Yeah, and I'm excited for this. I know we talked a little bit about, and I don't want to give any spoilers to the people out there listening yet, but you mentioned something there, and it's like you've got this long list of ex different experiences from the Ivy League to the high schools and, and to the formula building and all of that, but it's also the sports coaching. So what do you, the first question I got for you is, what do you feel that industry is currently getting wrong when they're looking at their training and development for their people? And maybe it's both sides, really. It's it's a, everybody's kind of pointing at everybody. Um, you need to fix this problem. Uh, we're not sure who you is, but everybody needs to fix this problem. And so I yeah. think the industry is really sitting down and evaluating what do they need versus what they want. And when we talk about coaching sometimes, we're, we're dealt the cards that we have, right? The, the players that we have, uh, we might have to change our system, might have to change some philosophy. Same thing in a classroom. You've you got a different set of students that are at different skill levels. You may have a class that's at really low skill level or a class that can, is a higher skill level. You need to go a little more advanced. So I think the industry needs to look at that the same way and say, what, what do we really need them to have? What do they really need to be able to come here and functionally do? And then I think the other side of it is, what can we train in-house? You know, Back in the old days, you grab somebody off the street and you can train them in-house and, and you had that time and that flexibility. Now, they really have to hit the ground running, but what can you train in, in the house and how can you leverage education to help with that training? I like that you point to leveraging um, education to, to help with it. And also like my experience in the trades and the, in, in the industry was something I think a lot of shops are missing the opportunity to leverage in all of this is also their partners, you know, their cutting tool suppliers, their machine tool suppliers, their, their, their CAD CAM solution providers, because all of those people have developed curriculum to help train up the people at being better at using their products. Have you seen the same? Like, Absolutely. When I was at Ivy Tech Community College, that was one of our struggles, right, was finding appropriate curriculum and appropriate information uh, to be able to teach our students the skills that are needed out there. And so you go to the typical books and you go in there and you start thinking, well, I, I really needed to be more specific to a tool that I'm using or to a brand that I'm using. And so, you know, as you started investigating and talking is, oh, yeah, that these companies have that already or they were developing it at that time. There was a shift where kind of people were starting to bring, you know, these companies were starting to bring uh, curriculum and education back into their sales of their equipment, 3D printers, uh, the, the CAD software and all that. So is being able to look into that, see how it fits, fitting it into your program, but asking questions. Hey, do you have anything on this content? Do you have something that I can, I can use to leverage to teach this concept here? Uh, you know, talk about tooling providers. They've got all kinds of nice little cheat sheets and websites and links you can go to that can share all kinds of information uh, with you. And you can help your students uh, understand how to find that stuff at the same time that you're also teaching them a concept. That's a great point, man. Ask the people that you're already getting stuff from in the first place and see... And you might be pleasantly surprised by what they already have available that you don't have to develop on your own in-house. I love it. So when we're talking the combination and you were talking, I wonder if there's a way you can expand on this. You were talking about, you know, in a classroom because you were in Ivy League and you were in high schools. 
that when you're in the classroom, you don't get any control about the students that show up in your classroom. And yet you've still got to deliver that same curriculum. You know, when you're on the, what sport did you coach? Sorry. Uh, football is 24 years and a, a few other sports. In between okay. that, yes. And, and same with football. You don't really get control over what kids sign up to play, especially depending on the age level, you get a really big mix of people that show up and want to be athletes. So what can, can people out there take from what you have learned with meeting people where they're at? What are some tips to meet people where they're at that might empower some employers out there listening? That's a great question. I think uh, one of the, the biggest things is really having an upfront conversation conversation early uh, with the with the students or the employer and, and or the employee and understanding where are they and, and again I think it goes back to the beginning is what are you trying to accomplish what are you trying to get them to do and what are the things you really need to get across um, to those that employee or to that student my colleague and I as we thought about redesigning our, our design technology program at Ivy Tech Community College we really sat down and thought about what is our industry asking us to do right away? What are the things that if they can get an internship in a year or in two semesters, what skills do they need to get to that point? And so we backed that up and really then thought about, okay, how do we include those skills into the curriculum that's there now? And then also how do we change it going forward? And I think uh, it's a kind of a long way to say is we, we really have to look at the curriculum and think about, is this a time to change? Is this a time that we need to just add in new technology? We need to bring in new techniques? Or is this a, a time where we really need to evaluate what's being taught? Uh, and there could be an entire shift of what we're needing to teach because the industry has changed so much. So it's a, it's a factor of being upfront, honest with yourself, not upfront and knowing the employee, knowing the student that can help us then drive change and drive where we need to take those students. So I like what you said there, Jason, about, you know, really meeting and, and getting curious with these people and having honesty on both sides, right? Having the employers be honest about what they're looking for, what they actually need them to do, but also having the people that show up be honest about what skills they currently have. I work in consulting with my business and it's a very similar thing. I show up, I need honesty from the people I'm talking to. So I love the parallels that I'm seeing as I get to learn more about manufacturing 23 years in. How, because you have the experience with Ivy League and with high schools, like, and now with everything that you're up to, how do you, what's the reception of the people? Like when you're getting curious with them, what kind of reception do you get from them when you're assessing their skills? Because some people might be worried about doing that. Sure. Um, and then would you have anything that you would suggest as maybe some possible questions they could ask that would help them suss out some of those skills? Sure. So I think one of the interesting things is, and we've talked about this, is we, they, they kind of don't know what they don't know. They are coming in because they've seen a 3D printer, they've seen a CNC machine, they've seen a CAD program, and they've seen this awesomeness. And they've seen it from maybe social media or something as... You know, stuff's becoming more popular and has been growing and continues to grow. But I think what we have to really understand is what are they, what are they really passionate about? Is it 3D printing? If it's 3D printing, then we need to have a different conversation. If it's CNC machining, well, that happens to be a whole other program that we need to take them over to and, and talk to them about. If it's about the software and using the CAD CAM platforms, again, it's a different conversation. So it's sitting down and saying, well, what interests you? Let's talk about some companies that maybe we know regionally or in our area that we know uh, that they do this type of work. Let's talk about what a day in a life looks like there. Does that interest you? Does that mm -hmm. spark you? Let's talk about maybe some of the shadow side of these things. You know, when you're talking about CNC machining, there's metrology, there's all these other things that have to go into it. Are you excited? about that are you okay with that does that sound you got to take a, a part off and you got to go measure it and then you got to record everything you got to make sure you got these processes down if that still sounds of interest then let, let's go down that path so it's again that conversation it's opening their eyes to what's out there so many students when you go by a building and you see dentist we know what dentist is we know what a welder is. We, we know what, uh, you know, construction that's going on. Oh, that's construction that's happening. But when you see a brick building that says Jason's shop or Arthur's machine shop, nobody knows what the heck that is or what the possibilities are, are in that building. And so 
we really got to have that conversation and open their eyes to what's out there, what's available, what the opportunity is, and then guide them through those tracks uh, and try to find the best place to be. I do think that there can be some help on the secondary level at the high school level of just as much as them trying to find out where they want to go, maybe trying some things to find out where they don't want to go at the same time and being okay mm. with failure down there and being okay with, I tried machining. I didn't really like it, but I tried additive 3d printing. I loved it. That's where I want to go. Especially that last bit there, Jason, when you're talking about like, well, maybe they don't like subtractive machining, the standard machining that, you know, I grew up on my bread and butter, but they love the additive world. And that world is just super rapidly advancing. I mean, metal printing used to be so complex sure. and so much moisture control and all this granular stuff and now you can 3d print with wire like mitsubishi just came had one at that expose at imts where they literally use a wire they use so they can do argon flux with the material as they're feeding it so there's no porosity oh crazy crazy right. advancements wow. um but it it points to what you can do with them right it's same with if someone's coming into your shop then you could do the same thing look to be in manufacturing you could be on the shop floor you could be in the offices you could be a programmer that's geeking out you could be their it support you could be their social media manager and still be involved in the world of manufacturing that desperately needs people so much so that assessment it's just a beautiful way to approach it and because you're asking what they're interested in. I really like that you pointed to that. You know, I did an interview the other day with a tool ram um, for my youth and manufacturing focus. And it was the same thing. I asked him, I'm like, well, like what's guiding you? And he's like, my interest. He's like, my interests are guiding me down my career path. And he go watch that. I'm not going to rehash the whole thing here, but he shared everything that was there for him. That was exciting him. And man, watching this 20 year old guy from California be all lit up about his career. I know other 20 year olds that dread every single morning they get up. Sure. So I love it, man. So the visibility thing, right? You, you talked about that. You mentioned the fact that construction sites, all of that, it's very obvious. You know, they see Jason's machine shop. It's a brick building. They don't know what the crap's going in there. What are some things that you have seen have brought visibility to manufacturing and maybe broken down that wall a little bit? Yeah, I think, you know, as a chair and as, a, as an educator at, uh, and, and doing it for a long time, and our goal was to get students jobs, is we really had to break down that, that barrier there uh, and really showcase what is out there. And we worked with architectural firms, uh, and a lot of people think architecture. They think, oh, you're, drawing an you're an architect, you're drawing the building and everything else. There's so much more underneath there. There's the mechanical, electrical, plumbing systems that have to be done. There's all the surveying and civil side of things that have to be done. Same thing on manufacturing. There's mm -hmm. so much more than just doing the drawing, printing it out and giving it to somebody or just pushing a button on a machine. There's so much more to it. So really having to open their eyes to that. We did a handful of things. Is one is we definitely worked on our advisory board internally and bringing in the industry into our advisory board so they can really advise our program and help us with understanding what is out there at the same time. I think that's one of the hard things too is understanding as a community – is what is out there. Uh, we, you know, we have the ones that, you know, the, the, the cheerleaders that are always involved, but we also need those others that aren't involved as much. So we know what's there. The other thing is we started um, uh, definitely doing internships and allowing students to have that exposure and even job shadows of just being able to go somewhere into there and say, hey, I'd like a tour. I'd like to be a part of this. Uh, my other colleague, Jamie, was great at setting those up for our students and getting them those, those shadows or at least taking a a class to somewhere. And then the last thing that we did that, that really helped with some su success when I was uh, at Ivy Tech Community College was a reverse career fair. So instead of a, an educator or a, a company having a booth and all these students walked around and talked to that company, each company that had a booth, is the students had a booth and showcased what they were doing and what they, they had completed so far, either in life or in their curriculum or you know wherever. And so what that did is that allowed the industry to come in and talk to our students to really understand what they're getting, what's happening in the curriculum, which gave me great feedback, allowed the industry to understand what the students actually have and can do, but also allowed the students to understand what the industry was and a little uh, different flip of the script, uh, being able to have a, a better conversation with the industry. And so that then allowed them to kind of figure out their path and where they wanted to go. 
I really like that concept for a few reasons, right? One, you're getting the students to assess themselves. Um, Self-assessment is an extremely valuable skill for any human being that wants a rewarding career. You need to be able to assess your own self, right? If you can't, you're going to just keep having these mismatches. And because you had the employers going around student to student, you don't have that natural a gap because those kids normally, if they were having to go booth to booth, how are they selecting those booths? They're not going to go to every booth. Well, some kids might because they're more open-minded, sure. but some kids won't. Oh, I'm going to go to the booth that does stuff like my dad or my mom or my uncle or my granddad, whatever. It's going to be someone they know that already has a career there. So it would like really like limit their focus. But now when you've got employers and I would imagine the employers went to every single student, then that student's now getting exposed to so many different options that they may never have considered. And they might've missed out on something that just like lit them up and got them super excited and super animated. Right. Like, Absolutely. We saw, beautiful. yeah, we saw so many times where the student, you know, when, when there was a career fair, it was kind of that booth going around. The students would, would go up and maybe ask a question, but they also didn't really know what yeah. questions to ask. When we flipped that script yeah. with the reverse career fair, the educators came in or the, the, the industry came in and said, I know what questions I need to ask. Let me ask them. And mm. so now, now they're getting asked these questions. They're like, well, I never thought how that applies to my learning or, oh, I didn't yeah. think that that was important when I was uh, in that class. Yeah. But you're, this is like the third company that's asked about it. Maybe I need to think about adding that more to my portfolio. That I didn't even think about that, man, where now because so many companies in a row have said they're looking for a certain skill, that student might be like, oh, actually, I'm not done with my schooling yet. Next semester, I'm going to add a class that right. touches on that. Like, to a lot. That is another. That's another beautiful outcome from like flipping the script like that. So schools out there, if you are watching this, I highly suggest you check out and and consider what Jason just per, suggested there and his feedback because that is totally different than I ever got to experience. Yeah, and I can't take credit for it. I stole it from other educators, and we just modified it to our, yeah. our thing. And that's and that's education, right? You still modify and use. Yeah, yeah and, and it worked out so well of getting our students um, prepared. And we also found students, like we talked about a second ago, is we found students that as they were talking to those employers, they were like, you know what? What they're asking me just doesn't doesn't get me excited. It doesn't jazz me up. I, I want to think about something else. I, I may want to look at a different path. I may want to take this other course yeah. that's outside of this now. Um, and we found that on both sides. Some of our manufacturing people, some of our architectural people, they ended up kind of finding out that they talked to the employers. I don't I want to go the other way. <laughs> I, I don't want to do the other thing. Yeah. yeah. There's just so many wins in that scenario, right? I love that you're humble. You're like, look, we didn't originate it. We stole it from someone. We fine tuned it. For the record, I'm sure you guys all have permission to do the exact same thing with what Jason said. Maybe you want to tweak it a little bit for your situation, but it's a beautiful idea. That's how we bring more visibility, which is something I know we're both passionate about. But the other thing too, and we're talking about all the training and all of the development, and I would like your your take on this after I share it, Jason. Sure. The feedback I get from like Gen Z and Gen Alpha now as they're coming into like middle school and high school is that having a path for continuous advancement, something that they can follow as they get into the working world is something that's on their radar, something that's very important for some of them, especially now that Gen Z is in their mid 20s, some of them, right? They're, while well, they're approaching their mid 20s, they keep looking for that. And I really think what we're trying to do for the trades, for manufacturing with the upskilling and all the advancements in technology and all of the requirements that they're changing with the automation and all these different logistics and the 3D printing and all of it, it really provides a great opportunity. But you've worked with youth far more than I have, sir. Do you feel like it's in alignment for what these kids are out there looking for? What do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, in, in my current role uh, at Autodesk, working with a lot of uh, educators as being a, um, a former community college instructor, working at the state level, not only just in Indianapolis area and, and teaching in a couple different states. I think one thing that, that we've seen is we're, we're still applying old teaching concepts to new technologies mm -hmm. and trying to fit those together. And that's causing some some pain points and that's causing pain points in terms of you know, students not being excited when they come in and, 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 and wanting to get rolling and going. And so I think, you know, this brings me back to an example of ours. When, when I first started at, at the community colleges, 
we had 32 weeks of hand drafting. But mm. when I was going out selling it to the students, I was showing them, you know, I, I have a 3D printer over here. I was showing them the 3D printer. I was showing them uh, the cool software that we're using. I was showing them my partnerships that we had. I was getting them all real excited. And then the first day is they get out tape and a drafting board and they go into this prison cell of a room that is nothing but these giant drafting boards. And they do that for 32 weeks. That just instantly mm. kind of killed the mood and killed the vibe of everything. Now, I'm not saying that that's not important yeah. stuff and we need to have those things, but we got to get them excited and we got to get them excited from the beginning uh, so they're ready to go. And restructuring the curriculum so that it keeps that excitement, that, that joy present for the learning rather than boring them out until they just drop out because what's the point? They can't because they don't know what the, the skill, like they know that they need the skills, but they don't know what the career offers long term so it's hard for them to justify the investment of that sucking period sure for for 23 weeks maybe if it was two week blocks or something shorter they'd be able to embrace the suck do something more practical embrace the suck do something more practical yeah, that's a, a great point and i, I even thought about it like that as yes if we have to have it how do we shorten it and i think maybe subconsciously yeah. when we redeveloped our entry level courses that was our theory. That was our theory of we literally went from drafting boards to cocktail napkins and said, you are in Arizona. You have to fly. Your boss is flying you out to Arizona to go measure this. And you got to take notes. When you get back to Indianapolis, yeah. you better have as many notes as you needed to make sure the information's there so that you can put it in a CAD program next. And so we really talked about yeah. that process. But I also think that allowed us as we started redeveloping the curriculum and working with the statewide chairs and really thinking about that, we use industry insights to help us, but we started thinking about how do we make the curriculum fluid? How do we make sure that mm -hmm. when that new technology or that new thing comes up, that we can adjust our curriculum enough to fit that new technology? But I think even now mm -hmm. that I think about it more is as generations come through and different teaching styles and different student types come through, how are we adjusting our curriculum for that as well? And we started doing that as I was leaving, and I'm seeing more of that now, of that emphasis, or the emphasis on that in the schools that, that I'm working with is they're starting to think about that, that teaching style and that teaching technique. The whole cocktail napkin thing, it, you're teaching them to ask the right questions, you're teaching them to gather the information, and you're also making it a bit of a game, right? You're gamifying it a little bit. Like, yeah. look, you get this much time to ask as many questions as you need, so now they've got to think, okay, what's the best questions to ask? You know, um, how many should I ask? What do I need to cover? All these different things. How am I going to gather this in a way that I can actually reconstruct this in CAD afterwards? So it's getting them to work on their mind. And when, you, when you're evolving your mindset like that, at least for me, I mean, I'm a learning junkie. Maybe I'm different than the average person. But I really love stuff like that because it challenges me. It gives me something to do. And, you know, obviously as the instructor, you might be, you might be upping the difficulty on the products that they're trying to reconstruct in CAD or whatever makes sense on that side. Sure. So that each time, maybe the questions are a little bit different. Maybe the complexity is a little higher, but that, that sounds like a really magnificent way to transform the way we look at it. And the last thing that you touched on, I don't want people to miss this, is that we need to put systems in place or something in place so that we're looking at the generational changes for educators and for students alike to make sure everyone's still able to work together. For me, I love it because it's outcome focused, right? Let's not get caught up in the methodology. A lot of manufacturing, the nomenclature that we use and, you know, saddles and slides and we use all kinds of names that you only use when you're taking your training and on the shop floor, we don't use that language anymore. Like right. I had to study that language when I had to take my test because we never used it in my training. I never used it. It's a lot of good things to consider. So I'd like you to have a little bit more and then we're going to close up after sure. this next little section. Yeah. So I, it's funny you talk about that because one of the last things I did when I, when I was teaching is we were going through and thinking about the, the, the terminology in general. But uh, one of the things that we came down to is we, I had an advisory board meeting and one of the things that we really had an issue with is 
everybody wanted us to teach the software that they were using in the industry. Well, when we came in and I had them all write it down, I had a white paper on there and I said, hey, when you come in, grab a donut, grab a coffee, write down the software you need our students to know. <laughs> and when they wrote it down, it was 52 or 53 softwares that they needed our, our mm -hmm. students to know at all the industry that I had. And I had a really good industry team on our advisory board. And I was like, everybody, I can't, I can't do that. A, I can't find people to teach that. I can't teach that many softwares. It's going to be nuts. What I did then is also had them also write down what's the skills and abilities they need. And what we did is we bucketized those and said, well, there's only about nine or 10 skills and abilities that we need. And if you're okay with not, not worrying about what software we're using, but I'm getting these skills and abilities built out and getting them what they need so they're functional and within your, your company, that leads back to our original statement was, then there needs yeah. to be some internal training. There needs to be then, hey, this is the software that we use. This is how we use it. This is how we do our stuff uh, internally. But you've got the core, the concepts, the foundation that we needed to get you that training while you're here. 100%, man. And that's a great thing to end on. Let's focus on the outcomes we want for our companies, for our skills, for our students, our learners, our employees, whatever you want to call them, depending on where you're working. And that's how we are going to get more people into manufacturing. We're going to impact the visibility of manufacturing because people that love their jobs, that feel challenged, that feel rewarded are going to tell more people about what they do. Thank you so much, Jason, for being here today and having this conversation. Thank you. To all my machinist friends out there, if you are watching and you haven't subscribed yet, I would really appreciate that. And until next time, keep your spindles turning and earning. Thank <laughs> you.